Hi everyone! In this video tutorial, I am planning to demonstrate you a method used to experimentally determine the friction factor of a round cross-section area pipe transporting fluids. For this aim, we are going to use a specialized laboratory test system that is described and is going to be studied in details in this video. Now, let me try to summarize the goal of this exercise as well as to explain the steps that are to be performed. First, let me start with specifying once again the main purpose of this video presentation, which is the following one. To determine experimentally the friction factor lambda obtained at different regimes of movement of the studied fluid flow and to present graphically the physical relationship where lambda is given as function of Reynolds number. Then, let's have a look on the laboratory test system diagram illustrated on the slide. Since we are going to visit, of course virtual for you, our laboratory where the system will be explained in details, I'm now going to skip talking too much about it. However, just let me make a short introduction and meet you with the system key elements presented on the diagram. It's written below. Position 1 is used to present the fan, which after being turned into exploitation, aims to ensure the studied fluid flow. In this case, this is going to be an airflow. With position 2, it is named the straight pipe used to transport the air. Position 3 indicates the so-called Prandtl tube, representing a classical basic device that measures velocity. Positions 4 and 5 are used to indicate the two manometers that are connected to specific points of the studied system. Let me make it clear for you what is the idea of using the two manometers and therefore you will be able to understand why they are connected in such way. Manometer 4 is a required mandatory component to the Prandtl tube. The velocity is obtained by measuring the dynamic pressure of the fluid flow presented as difference between the total and static pressure filled at its both ends. Manometer 5 aims to measure the pressure drop between the two ends of the studied pipe section. This is the section between 1, 1 and 2, 2. As can be seen, this section represents a straight pipe where there is lack of local resistance, the so-called minor energy loss. In this regard, the measured pressure drop is a result of friction only. So actually, we are going to measure the friction energy loss, but presented in the form of pressure. And then, based on the well-known darcy weisbach formula for their calculation, we will derive an equation for calculating the friction factor. Finally, position 6 indicates the throttle valve installed at the end of the pipe. This valve is used to regulate the system flow rate. On the next slide, it is presented individual pictures of the key system elements previously discussed. So, let's have a look on it. Picture 1 represents general view of the laboratory test system. Picture 2 represents a close view of the throttle valve installed in the pipe output. Picture 3 represents a close view of the Prandtl tube installed in the pipe in a specific way. What does it mean? The tube is mounted so that its input to be positioned at a given distance, which is said to be 0.223 from the pipe radius, measured from the wall. This guarantees with sufficient accuracy, maximum deviation is about 2-3%, that the measured in this point velocity will be equal to the flow average velocity. 
This will enable us to do the velocity measurement quick and easy. Feature 4 represents the liquid manometers used, as previously described. Now, let's move on to the next slide and say something more about the sequence of work, the data collection and data processing. The actions to be performed are briefly described in just few sentences. The pan one has to be turned into exploitation. Then, by using the throttle valve 6, a different flow rate is ensured. Every try requires the indication of two work parameters. LD, which is the dynamic length measured by the manometer 4, and delta L measured by the manometer 5. To perform the required calculations, the following equations are to be used. Equation 1 is used to estimate the flow dynamic pressure measured by the manometer 4. Equation 2 is used to estimate the pressure drop in the studied straight pipe section measured by the manometer 5. Equation 3 is used to estimate the flow average velocity as for this aim the preliminary calculated flow dynamic pressure is used. Equation 4 is used to estimate Reynolds number which requires for the flow average velocity to be already known. And finally, equation 5 is used for the final estimation of the friction factor. On the next slide, it is presented a sample data table where the measured data to be collected, as well as after calculation is performed, the final values of the previously mentioned parameters to be included, like shown in this slide. Before do the measurement, it has to be taken into account that this requires for some input data to be preliminary collected. So in this case, we need to know in advance the following. The manometer constant, which in this certain case is the same for both the two manometers, and is set to be 0.2. We can check this when visit the laboratory. I'm going to show you a little bit later. The density and kinetic viscosity of the transported air are set to be approximately, of course, 1.215 kg per cubic meter and 0.4 times 0146 squared meters per second concerning these two parameters. The pipe sizes, diameter and length respectively are 68 millimeters and 2.75 meters. In the table, colored in red, is presented the data for the two parameters that are to be measured. A video from the laboratory will demonstrate how this has happened. Before I forget, just have a look below, uh, because it is provided information about the work liquid in the two manometers, which is alcohol, and therefore its density is approximately 820 kg per cubic meter. Now, before we move on to the next action, which is visit the laboratory, Let's make a brief theoretical overview that aims to answer the most important question. Why do we need to do it? The exercise, I mean. The simple answer of this question is the exercise aims to test experimentally a popular theoretical statement. However, let me explain into details what does it mean. It is stated that the Reynolds number determining the regime of movement of the fluid flow has the greatest impact on the friction factor, respectively on the energy loss, in case of laminar regime of movement, after which it begins to weaken, as in the last rate of turbulence, the so-called full turbulent regime of movement, its effect is insignificant, reliable. This is the statement that we're going to check right now. Is it true or not? 
as an incontestable evidence performing an analysis of the equations applied in estimating the friction factor can be used. However, first it requires for the approximate limits boundary conditions of the separate regimes of movement of fluid flows to be specified. For this aim, I am now going to use the following diagram presented on the slide. There are various number of equations used to estimate the friction factor. In a previous YouTube video, I have already been discussed the topic concerning the selection of the most appropriate equation used to estimate the friction factor. You can watch it by using the link below, given in the video content. But, in my personal opinion, I propose to dwell on the most practical of them, where the calculation can be performed quick and easy. The recommended equations are presented on the slide. The analysis of the formulas indicates that in the first equation for the laminar regime, the Reynolds number in the denominator is of the first degree. Then, passing into the first turbulent regime, its degree is reduced up to 0.25. This is a clear indication of reducing the Reynolds number impact on the determination of the friction factor. When we move on to the second turbulent regime, the degree of the Reynolds number remains 0.25, but a second parameter, the equivalent pipe wall roughness, appears in the denominator, also influencing the, the, the determination of the friction factor. In the case of full turbulent regime of movement, Reynolds number has just been gone from the equation, which means, in other words, that it has zero impact on the determination of the friction factor. Let me summarize. As a result of the theory analysis, the following relationship presented graphically between Reynolds number and the friction factor could be predicted. So, just keep watching. I'm going to start a short video presentation. This coordinate system is used to present lambda as function of Reynolds. The values below are the boundary conditions concerning the different flow regimes of movement, while the dotted lines are used to separate the areas related to the different flow regime of movements. The analysis of the proposed equations is used so to predict what the trend concerning each flow regime should represent. The red line is related with the laminar regime of movement, where we know that Reynolds has most significant impact on the determination of lambda. Then it is the so-called unspecified area, which represents a mixture of turbulent and laminar, where Reynolds still has significant impact on the determination of lambda. The next one, the blue curve, represents, the dark blue curve, represents the first rate of turbulence, where still Reynolds has significant impact on the determination of lambda, but it's less compared with the previous cases. This one is the transitional area where the decreasing of the impact of Reynolds continues. And finally, for the full turbulent regime of movement, we said that Reynolds has zero impact or reliable insignificant impact, which means that we expect, if the theory is correct, that the curve representing this trend should be a straight line like it is given in the picture. Now, let's go in our laboratory where to perform the experiment. We will be there in a minute. Welcome to our laboratory. So, let me introduce you with the system. This is the fan and this is the motor used to run the fan into exploitation. So, then you can see the straight pipeline. Oh. Here is the Prandtl tube that you were already able to see in the pictures. And it is connected with one of the two manometers. So, 
I'm coming back to the straight pipe, and you see in the two points of this straight pipe, there are two flexible tubes connected with the second manometer. And finally, at the end, it is the throttle valve that will be used to regulate the system flow rate. So the flow rate regulation can be accomplished by changing the positioning of the valve, as can be seen right now. When specifying the input data, we said that the manometer constant is set to be 0.2. So you can see the information is taken from here. The deviation is 1 to 5, which is equal to 0.2. It depends on the angle on which the tube of the manometer is positioned. It is absolutely the same and with the second manometer. So we use the same constant value. Now you can have a look on what really Prandato tube represents. It's much better than watching in the pictures. So this is the Prandato tube. This is the input and the two outputs which respectively enable us to measure the difference between the total and static head. Okay, so now I will do the setting for the first flow rate. As for this aim, I will use the fourth hole because if I put it here, here or here, the deviation in the measurement will be significant, so I'm not sure about the uh, sufficient accuracy of the results. So that's why we will start from hole number four. Okay, now we can go run the system into exploitation. Okay, let's start now. It will be a little bit noisy. Okay, so now we are ready to do the first measurement. So in this position, this is the indication of manometer 4, which is used for the measuring of the dynamic pressure of the fluid flow, which you know is used so for the estimation of the average velocity. And now, this is the indication of manometer, of manometer 5, which is used to indicate the pressure drop in the system. Now I'm gonna change the flow rate to increase it. Okay, let's increase the flow rate. I put it in the next hole. And now we go back to see the new measurements. As can be seen, we come back again to manometer 4, which indication increased in its value because the flow rate was also increased. So this is manometer 4, and now we move to manometer 5. I decided to skip recording all the tries during the experiment because the same action is repeated. However, moving on to the data processing, for convenience, I have taken pictures of all the measurements which will be presented to you onto the next few slides. Thus, if you wish, anyone could stop the video and indicate the results themselves, on the basis of which we will further perform the required calculations. So, there are a few more slides like this, and I will give you enough time before move on to the next slide, so to be able to have a quick view and see how the results are given, just follow the red markers which aims to indicate the point where the measurement is taken. So there is one more slide. And now we have all the required information that we need so to move to the next, which is also the last step, the data processing. And after do the calculations, we will be able to plot the graphical relationship that we are looking for and then compare the results obtained with the theoretical prediction. But I recommend you to 
do this part in Excel. Prepare this work Excel sheet in advance where you can see it is given the input data, something that we already know. It is included the equations that are going to be used uh, for the calculation, as well as with the red color, it is given the measured data of the two parameters, the dynamic length and delta L. So now let's fill the gaps in the table. As for this aim, I'm going to use the relevant equations. So the dynamic pressure, PD, I'm going to use equation number one. As can be seen, first I need to take into account the density of the liquid in the manometer, which we said is alcohol. Then I have to multiply it with the dynamic length measured by us. Then I have to multiply this with the gravity acceleration. Then I have to divide with 1000 because the measured length is measured in millimeters and this way I'm going to automatically convert it into meters. And finally, at the end, I have to multiply with the constant of the manometer, which you are able to see by watching the video that it is 0.2. So this is the value for the dynamic pressure of the fluid flow in the first case. And as can be seen, only the dynamic length is the changing parameter. So to do quickly the rest of the calculation, I can put this symbol for all the other parameters that remains constant. Okay. And then we can do the estimation automatically. Empty column, which represents the pressure drop came as a result of friction, will be filled in a similar way with the previous one because it is used absolutely the same type of manometer. So I will just repeat the same actions. Of course, this time I'm going to use the second measured diameter, delta L. Okay, don't forget to divide with 1000. We already said Y. And finally, let me use the manometer constant. Okay, so we're going to repeat absolutely the same action. So to do the calculations quick and easy. Those are the parameters that remain constant. Okay, so we've got the results concerning the pressure drop. It's time to estimate the velocity for each of the insured flow rates. For this aim, we're going to use equation number three. Okay, so it should be done fast. We have the two times dynamic pressure uh, divided with the density of the air, which we said is approximately 1.2. And I have to put this on the relevant degree. It's like this. Okay, so let's have a look. The only one changing parameter is the dynamic pressure, while 2 is a constant value and the density air of the air is also a constant. So just a moment. Okay, now we are ready to estimate the rest of the velocities. Okay, this is also completed. So we only need to calculate the
the two parameters that are required for the plotting of the studied curve. Now let's do the calculations concerning Reynolds number in the last column. As for this aim, we're gonna use equation number four. Okay, I'm gonna demonstrate it. We have to multiply the velocity with the pipe diameter. Uh, it's given in millimeters, so don't forget to divide it with 1000. Okay, and we also need to divide this with the kinetic viscosity of the airflow. Okay, I think that it's done. Perfect, so now let's mark the constant parameters, which in this case are the diameter and the kinetic viscosity. Okay. The last parameter to be estimated is the friction factor. Of course, we're gonna use equation number five. So let me start with, with it. So we have to multiply two times the pipe diameter. Don't forget to divide with 1000. Then we have to multiply with the pressure drop, which came as a result of friction. And we have to divide with the following. First, the pipe length. Then is the density of the air. And finally, the squared velocity. Uh, this should be F9. Okay, so now let's have a look which parameters remains constant. These respectively are the diameter, the length of the pipe, and the density. So let's mark them as constant. Okay, and now we are ready to complete the calculations. So these are the final values concerning the determination of the friction factor. So as can be seen, it happens what we expected in general. With the increasing of Reynolds number, the value of the coefficient of friction starts to decrease. And have a look at the last three values, which are almost the same. This is probably the moment when we already moved into the last rate of turbulence, the so-called quadratic or full turbulent regime of movement, where we said that the expectation is for a straight line. But the better and really clear analysis can be performed after we plot the uh, graphical relationship between these two parameters. So let me do it right. I'll do the graphical representation of the studied relationship in a separate Excel sheet. So let's move on it. Okay, let's start now and see what happens. So let me select the proper data. 
first for the x-axis I'll come back to the table with the data so we have array nodes for the x-axis and we have lambda for the y-axis okay so let's see the result here is it so we obtained the studied graphical relationship now i'm going to specify the certain boundary conditions of the studied airflow then we'll transfer this information back into the main presentation where we will be able to do the final analysis and give an answer of the question which was whether or not the studied theoretical statement is true now let's summarize everything done so once again let's present the final results obtained the two columns with red color are the measured data and the rest were calculated as it was demonstrated so based on this data it was obtained this final curve representing lambda as function of Reynolds. The green line and the three red lines specify the different regimes of movement of the studied airflow. So, as I told you, we were unable to measure some, um, some flow regimes related to the laminar regime of movement because I wasn't sure for the accuracy of the results obtained. But we have enough information that covers the rest of the three turbulent regimes of movement. And as can be seen, the curve which is based on real experiment is very similar to the prediction. So in conclusion, what can we say? We can say that the experiment confirms and fully corresponds to the studied well-known theoretical statement.